Now, I'm going to get very practical, and, and I will say up front that a lot of things that I'm saying here are going to be controversial, and I know that in every situation, everything doesn't apply exactly the same way. And I'm talking mainly about planting churches here. Seven ways that outside funding can hinder church multiplication. First of all, it can kill local initiative. As we've said, local people have got to have that sense of ownership. And there's a, if there's a feeling, well, somebody else will pay the bill. There's some rich uncle out there. They're willing to pay the way so we can just take life easy. Well, obviously that's never going to become self-sustaining and reproducing. Communicating that ministry is dependent on money. How quickly we fall into this, because we know money is powerful and money can move a lot of things. But ultimately, money is only a tool, one of many. And ultimately, the life of a church, the reproduction of a church, is going to be a spiritual thing. And it's very easy because we look at uh, ministries that have a lot of money and they can do a lot of projects and have uh, fancy programs and technology and so on. We think, wow, you know, that's what we've got to have. The early church grew and thrived without much. In fact, the fastest growing churches in the world today, if you look at the churches in China, the churches in Africa, these are the churches with the least amount of money. They're among some of the poorest people in the world. And yet, they're thriving, they're growing, they're reproducing. So we need to be cautious about assuming that you just can't plant a church if you don't have this huge budget. Or creating a sense of inferiority. Sometimes you have a well-meaning person who says, oh, you poor people, you're so poor and you just don't have so much, but we've got so much and we're so generous, we can just, we'll help you out of your, your, sorry, most, your sorry state and we'll help you by giving you this and that. And you see, that becomes condescending. That's not a genuine act of, of love, really. A person may mean well, but that's not really helping in the long run. It can make people just feel more sorry for themselves and more helpless because you've just reinforced that you don't have, I have. If you only had what I have, you'd be better off. That's, that's not a spirit that is empowering at all. Or misdirecting energy away from creative problem solving to fundraising. We want our energy to be, create, be focused on mobilizing what God has given us. What are the resources we have? How can we maximize that instead of trying to always look somewhere else for solutions? Five, it can foster a mercenary spirit. And I wish I didn't have to say this, but we know that it does happen. It doesn't always happen, but it happens often enough where unfortunately uh, there may be a person who really feels called to serve God, but they go to the person who's willing to pay them the most money. And I realize that in places where there's poverty, um, to have a secure salary that somebody's paying is a, is a, is a thing that is not to be underestimated. But unfortunately, the money can begin to drive the system. And in China, there were situations where people say, well, why should I, you're paying him to share the gospel. Why should I share the gospel if you're not willing to pay me? And that can create a, a, a very unfortunate situation. Or employing the wrong people. Ajit Fernando has written on this question and he said, you know, the problem is not so much the support that, that people generously give, but very often outsiders support the wrong people. Now, as an American, this is what can happen. An American group comes, they vid visit a foreign country, they meet somebody who speaks very good English. Oh, well, that's good, because you know, maybe not too many people speak English here. And maybe that person who speaks really good English is sort of charming and seems like a really, really good person and so on, and they say, we want to support that person. You know what happened one time? I was visiting a little Bible school in, in a, a part of Asia, and they said, you know, a group came through, and they met this young girl who's a Bible student with us, and she speaks real good English, very charming, and said, oh, we want to give her a full scholarship. We're just so impressed with her. She said, she's one of our biggest problems. We almost had to expel her from the school. Well, see, the outsider didn't, didn't know all of that. And so sometimes the outsider ends up supporting a person who really is the wrong person. And so that can be a negative factor. Well, those are sort of, 
but one more, uh, creating long-term dependencies. We've already talked about the difficulty with this. It's just not reproducible. But let's talk about some positive ways. I want to be positive here. Positive ways that outside funding can help church planting and reproduction. And one of those is what I call the launching, the startup funds, specific projects. So this would be like those jumpstart cables. They're not permanent, but they do help get something launched. And sometimes, especially in a pioneer situation, it is hard, hard work. And you just need some extra assistance to get that thing in motion. You know, in the old days, the big jet engines on the, the old 707s, they couldn't just start those motors themselves. There was not like your car, you have a key and you just turn it on and start the jet engine. They literally had these trucks that would come out with an electric generator to generate enough electricity to, to literally jumpstart those jet engines. And sometimes we need that, that 747, the tow rig won't get it off the ground. But sometimes there is a need for a push, an impulse of some extra resources to get it started. And so those would be startup funds or perhaps a special project. But it's not something that's going to be uh, creating a long-term dependency. Or there's what I call lengthening funds. Now this is when funding comes in the form of matching grants. A church, say, and the outside might say, so you want to build a church building. Well, for every dollar you raise, we will donate a dollar. Or maybe we'll donate five dollars for every dollar you can raise. The point is simply this. By having a matching fund, it guarantees that the local people are committed. And that's what you want to see. It's not just a giveaway, but there's local commitment. Because sometimes if somebody from the outside comes and says, hey, we got this great idea. We want to do this big project, and it's going to cost so and so much money. And they're going to pay for all of it. And the local people say, well, we don't think it's a very good idea. But it's free, so hey, you know, go ahead and do it, right? But it really wasn't very smart. Well, you see, by having a matching fund, in that case, the local people would say, now, so we've got to donate, you know, a third of the money to make that happen. We don't think that's a good idea. See, now they're going to bring a little more wisdom in because they're not going to be committed to it. So by having matching sort of arrangements, uh, it just helps to identify what the local people think is a good idea and what the local people are also committed to and willing to sacrifice. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. When we were planning a church in Ingolstadt, we were having a major evangelistic event. It was going to it wasn't super expensive, but it was going to cost some money that was beyond our means. And so one-third of the money was coming from America, one-third of the money came from a mother church, another German church, and one-third of the money came from our own people. And that was a commitment. They felt committed enough. They could make that commitment. And it was a sacrifice, and we did it. And so it was a good way for everybody to be involved, to share resources in a meaningful way. Then there's also leveraging funds, and this is, would be funding for leadership development. In other words, I'm not just paying necessarily a pastor to pastor a church for the next 20 years. But what I am doing is I'm saying we will pay to educate the people who are the pastors or the future pastors. And that, of course, can come in many forms. It can come in a form like TVS, the program we're doing right here, that is helping educate and train leaders in churches in many places. We're not creating a dependency in any one local church. <clears throat> what we are doing is providing a resource to help strengthen the leadership of those churches. So I call that leveraging because the investment in training is hopefully going to have big returns later down the road. And then there's linking funds. In other words, we're not necessarily giving funds into a specific church to just keep that sort of on life support, but what we might have is, say, a church planning coach. 
and this might be a national worker. And that church planning coach travels maybe throughout the region, giving guidance to the different churches that are being planted there. And that person needs some extra assistance for their travel or for some of their support. Uh, the local churches are maybe just strong enough to sustain their own ministry, but there's not a lot extra for these more regional types of ministries. And so this sort of networking type or association funding can help facilitate a movement, but it doesn't affect the local initiative of local churches. And then what I call loving funds, compassion and development. Maybe there's a famine and we need relief to come in. And so we, we demonstrate the love of Christ by coming in to alleviate an immediate kind of need. Or maybe people in a certain region don't have jobs. And so we come in with a job training program for a particular type of uh, job that would be uh, sustainable and provide employment for people. So these are ways of demonstrating the love of Christ. Uh, but again, it's not affecting so much the life of an individual church. And by the way, on this point, I just want to emphasize that it's, it's a very dangerous thing for a local church to become involved in business endeavors themselves. Because what can happen is that local church, the elders of that church, should really be focused on the spiritual life of caring for their congregations. And if you have a business venture going on, then how are they going to manage a business and the church? And then sometimes the businesses don't make money and then church funds go towards trying to keep the business going and it gets very, very messy. Or you have people who are members of the church that work in the business, but they're really not very good business people. They really don't belong there, but now they're church members. And so what do you do then? It gets very complicated. And so I strongly urge if in these development type programs, job creation, keep it legally and administratively separate from the local church. Otherwise, you're going to have conflicts of interest. And this has happened historically over and over again, well-meaning projects where churches have got involved in business endeavors that have ended up splitting the church, distracting the energy, and basically the churches don't grow. Sometimes worse happens. <clears throat> then there's lending money, creating revolving funds. In other words, you have a fund, say, for church planting or maybe for church buildings, and that money can be loaned out to launch new projects or maybe to build a building, but then the money is paid back into that revolving fund so the funds become available for the next project or the next church that is started. That's another way to uh, create uh, resources, but use them in a way that don't create long-term dependencies. And as always, watch out for the manipulative money from the outside. Um, I can't say this often enough. It's very tempting when somebody comes from the outside and say, we're going to give your movement so and so many dollars, um, or we're going to give your, your church this and that uh, equipment or sound system, whatever. There's almost always strings attached. There's almost always something that they're going to ask of you that may not be your conviction. And it can be tempting to accept those kind of gifts and then get yourself into a situation that you don't want to be in. Any local church needs to have that sense that they can follow God's leading and follow their convictions and then no outsider can come in and buy their convictions or buy their passions. And so one has to be cautious about that. I think we will at this point go ahead and take a break again. And after the break, I want to talk about two things that are really very, very predominant in church planning these days, and that is short-term teams and partnerships. These are uh, developments that are becoming enormous all over the world, wherever you're working. Short-term teams coming from the outside and then partnerships with other outside organizations or churches. How do you navigate that in a church plant in a healthy way? We'll talk about that after the break. <clears throat> 